Number five on this list is the Devil's Town. The Devil's Town is a place in Serbia that's basically a collection of very interesting natural forming rocks. Or at least we think it's natural forming. Mehana Mihajovic says the Devil's Town is one of the widely known places in Serbia. Situated between two ravines of the creepy names the Devil's Ravine and Hell's Ravine, there lies the spookiest natural monument. Over 200 randomly formed stone poles up to 20 meters in height. Almost all the poles carry the black cap from volcanic rock and a site, adding to the overall peculiar atmosphere around the place. Close to the locality, there are fresh mineral water wells and ruins of an old church. The mysticism of the Devil's Town Natural Monument keeps fueling the imagination of the local people. One of the widely known legends suggests that a long time ago, local Local people threw a wedding party for a brother and a sister that fell in love with a little help from the devil's spells. God wanted to punish all the attendees and turned them into the stones where they still lay to this day. The other legend suggests that the devil's poles are actually local kids who refused to learn and decided to live an immoral life stripped of knowledge. It sure sounds like a great way to make your kids do their homework. So regardless of which legend you choose to believe in, this is evidence that the devil was once around here. As far as what sort of message this leaves behind, I guess you need to be the one to decide, right? Is this a way for the devil to just reinforce his legitimacy? Is this a way for the devil to instill fear in people? Is this a way for the devil to tell us that we should actually be fearing God? These are all interesting things to consider and think about when we're talking about the devil's town. I will say something and give the devil a little credit. If these rocks were actually formed by him and some devilish activity, then honestly, nice work, man. They're very cool and made a strong push to become part of the seven natural wonders of the world. Maybe people decided to leave them out of that list, though, because promoting something created by the devil himself might not be the best idea. Comment down below what you guys think this weird and creepy formation of rocks could truly mean. Number four on this list is Hotel California. Hotel California is right up there as being one of rock best songs ever. I feel like I have a very special connection to the Eagles classic because I remember in 10th grade or sometime in high school, I had to do a project breaking down a classic song and looking at the lyrics and really evaluating them. I decided to do mine on Hotel California and it was through this project that I learned something very interesting about this piece of music. Hotel California may have been partly written by the devil. Thoman says it's not only on Halloween that you you can expect the devil to be up to no good in the background. For example, with the super hit Hotel California by the Eagles, when played in reverse, the secret message says, Satan, he hears this. He had me believe incredible or verifiable. Was the ruler of hell involved making the Eagles greatest hits album the best selling album of the 20th century in the US? Now this is the message you get when you play it backwards, but you don't even need to play it backwards to get some pretty weird messages just listening to it in general. The whole song itself is a complete trip. One line in the song says, this could be heaven or this could be hell. Another line says, we are all just prisoners here of our own device. And finally the song finishes by saying, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. The whole song itself could be one big metaphor for hell, let alone the secret message in the song that you hear when you listen to it in reverse. What do you guys think? Was this actually the work from the devil? Number three on this list is the Devas. The Devas actually come from the religion Zoroastrianism and are part of that religion's demonic entities. If you're unfamiliar with that religion, then just know that it is one of the oldest religions ever and is still being practiced today. Well, there are tons of messages in scripture and artwork describing these demons that basically act as warning messages to all who may have the misfortune of running into them. Grunge says, traditionally Devas are thought to be the creation of Ahriman, an antagonist and equally powerful counterpart to the benevolent creator. In one of their religious texts, the Gathas, Devas are described as rejected gods with an affinity for evil who, for whatever reason, still hold sway with some followers. One of their chief character traits is an inability to discern truth from lies, making them at least psychologically adjacent and possibly directly related to most 
roommates that you've likely met on Craigslist. All kidding aside though, these things can be very, very dangerous and many people believe that a lot of the work and scripture that talks about them, that was actually left behind from the devil. The purpose of doing this was to strike fear into people and make them start to distrust their fellow human. Number two on this list is the blood falls. Once again, we have a naturally occurring wonder that people believe is actually a hidden message from the devil. Let me tell you the geological explanation of this and then I'll tell you the possible demonic explanation. Atlas Obscura says roughly two million years ago the Taylor Glacier sealed beneath it a small body of water which contained an ancient community of microbes. Trapped below a thick layer of ice they have remained there ever since, isolated inside a natural time capsule. Evolving independently of the rest of the living world, these microbes exist in a place with no light or free oxygen and little heat and are essentially the definition of primordial ooze. The trapped lake has very high salinity and is rich in iron, which is what gives the waterfall its red color. A fissure in the glacier allows the subglacial lake to flow out, forming the falls without contaminating the ecosystem within. So that's the geological explanation. The one involving the devil isn't as calm and cool though. This legend says that a man died and was sent to hell. Now he got there and obviously didn't love where he was. The man was continuously tortured and mistreated treated as we can all expect from being in hell. Well apparently this particular man wasn't about staying here forever. One day he attempted a daring escape and actually made it pretty far. He found a gateway between hell and the natural world. This gateway led directly to Antarctica where the falls are now. He made it back to our physical world but then the devil showed up. The devil brutally mutilated and cut the man to pieces creating a waterfall of blood. The devil then seized sealed this blood in ice as a warning and message to everyone left on earth never to attempt to go in or out of hell. Finally, number one on this list is the Codex Gigas. This book often makes all of our lists when we're talking about the most haunted or most cursed books ever, and rightfully so. This book written many, many years ago was literally by the hand of the devil. Mental Floss says the book's sinister reputation stems from a full color portrait of the devil contained in its pages and a legend about how the image got there. According to folklore, the book is the work of a monk, possibly Hermanus Hermitus or Herman the Recluse, who had broken his vows and been sentenced to be walled up alive in the monastery. He struck a deal to save himself. If, over the course of a single night, he could write a book containing all the world's knowledge, his life would be spared. When he realized the task was impossible, the monk sold his soul to the devil, who helped him finish the book and signed it with the now infamous portrait. Now I'd love to tell you guys what message the devil left for us in here, but that would require me to read the book myself, which I have absolutely no intention of ever doing. Legends have been told of people becoming insane and losing their minds and all sense of reality after reading it. So even if I did read it with the intention of relaying the messages to you guys, I don't know if I'd even be capable of doing so. It's been kept in Sweden National Library and has been there for several hundred years if you guys wanted to go and give it a read. I don't recommend it. Number five on this list is the Panama 7. The following story happened only a few years ago and is a horrifying tale where seven people in Panama were found dead from a terrifying ritual. The BBC writes 10 people have been arrested on suspicion of murder. The suspects and all victims were thought to belong to the Nagobi indigenous community. The grave was discovered after three villagers escaped and made their way to a local hospital last weekend, Prosecutor Rafael Beloy said. They then alerted authorities about several families being held by an indigenous run sect. On Wednesday, police raided the community located in a jungle region in northwest Panama, some 250 kilometers from the capital Panama City. They were performing a ritual inside the structure. In that ritual, there were people being held against their will, being mistreated, said Mr. Beloys. All of these rites were aimed at killing them if they didn't repent their sins. Inside the makeshift church, officers found a naked woman, machetes, knives, and a ritually sacrificed goat, Mr. Beloy said. The site was controlled by a religious sect called the New Light of God, believed to have been operating in the region for about three months. According to Mr. Beloy's, the kidnapping and torture started last Saturday after one of the members claimed to have received a message from God. The victims were then kidnapped from their homes, beaten, and killed. 
So let me ask you guys, does that sound like something that God would tell you to do? Gather up a bunch of people, hold them against their will, and torture and kill them? To me, if any sort of entity was to tell you to do something like that, then that would be a demon or maybe the devil. Maybe that demonic entity would portray themselves as God or someone else, but I don't know what type of God would do something like this. To be completely honest, folks, I'm really not a religious person, so when I hear something like this, I believe that this was the work of people who were extremely sick or misguided. But I can guarantee to them, they probably really felt like they were acting as the vessel for some higher being. I think in this instance though, they really did misjudge who that higher being was. This happened literally back in 2020 as well guys, so really not that long ago. My heart truly does go out to the people that were killed and to the families of those who were taken way too soon. Number four. Four on this list is The Devil Made Me Do It. This famous Ed and Lorraine case may be the best example of when someone tried to claim a demonic possession led to a crime. The case is centered around a young man named Orrin Cheyenne Johnson and the man that he murdered, a 40 year old named Alan Bono. Mental Floss says there was no question that Johnson killed Bono. However, his defense attorney, 33 year old Martin Minella, planned to argue that the 19 year old was not guilty by virtue of demonic possession. Ahead of the trial, Minela pled his case through the media, giving interviews to major press outlets. The courts have dealt with the existence of God, and now they'll be asked to deal with the existence of the demonic spirit, Minela told People. The day after Johnson was arrested, Lorraine Warren called the Brookfield police and blamed the killing on a demon. Johnson didn't actually say the devil made him do it, he only claimed that he didn't remember stabbing Bono. However, according to the testimony of an officer on the scene, Johnson did tell the police, I think I hurt someone. Now this defense didn't actually work out for Johnson. He was inevitably convicted of first degree manslaughter and sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. However, he didn't serve nearly that many and was released after less than 5 years for being a really good prisoner. In my opinion, I kind of doubt that this guy was actually under the influence of a demonic possession and clearly the jury, they felt the same way. That that being said though, he did seem pretty committed to that story during the trial, so I suppose it's something to consider. Number 3 on this list is Manuel Vela. Several years ago, Manuel Vela killed his pregnant girlfriend. It was a brutal murder and an incident which climaxed in a police chase where he was finally captured. Many people obviously asked the question, why? And the answer may shock you. The Mystique says Vela told the interviewers that the murder of his girlfriend and her child were part of a religious and political statement. He was possibly trying to enlighten the crowd of his opinion on pro-life ideologies. However, it seemed like his motivation behind the murders wasn't just politically backed. He went on to say how he is the Antichrist and the voices in his head guided him on what to do. Many of his analogies were akin to things that have happened in the history of Christianity. Christianity. Vela literally believed that he was the Antichrist, guys. That sounds like a pretty textbook example of a demonic possession to me. At this point, Vela's competency to stand trial was in question and a hearing needed to be done. Manuel never actually made it to the hearing though, because in January 2017, authorities found him dead in his cell. He had taken his own life. Number two on this list is the Son of Sam. The Son of Sam was a killer that caused one of the biggest biggest citywide police investigations Ever. Ranker says New York City during the summer of 1976 was a hotbed of anger, frustration, and fear, and David Berkowitz, aka the son of Sam, didn't help the matter by killing six people and wounding seven others in the span of one year. After his arrest, Berkowitz told police that he was under the control of a demon named Harvey who inhabited his neighbor's dog and implored him to kill people. Once, during a three month break from his murder spree, Berkowitz wrote the New York Post to say, I am still here like a spirit roaming the night. Thirsty, hungry, seldom stopping to rest. After being incarcerated, Berkowitz received a sentence of 365 years in prison, by the way. He became a born again Christian, but he still believes that the devil and God are fighting for possession of his soul. No wonder this guy got 365 years. Not only did he kill six people, but to write to the Times saying that he He's still thirsty and hungry? Yeah. 
This is clearly a man that needs to be kept behind bars for literally ever. Once again, I want to stress the fact here that I'm not a religious man personally. When I hear a story like this, I believe that it's far more likely that the son of Sam was just truly mentally unstable and probably in need of some very serious help. He truly believed though that a demon had called upon him and was using his body as a vessel for evil. We may never know what truly caused him to do this, but at least he's locked up for good and won't be doing it again anytime soon. And finally, number one on this list is Michael Taylor. Several decades ago, Taylor was apparently possessed by a horrible demon and this time it really got the better of him. Ranker says in 1974, Michael Taylor was just a simple butcher living in Osset, England, who was suddenly overcome by an evil spirit. He had an exorcism performed on October 5th and 6th of 1974, and while it went okay, the priests weren't able to expel all of the demons. According to Bill Ellis, an authority on folklore and the occult and contemporary culture, in an all-night ceremony, the exorcists believed that they had invoked and cast out at least 40 demons, including those of incest, bestiality, blasphemy, and lewdness. At the end, exhausted, they allowed Taylor to go home, although they felt that at least three demons, insanity, murder, and violence, were still left in him. So, you know, kind of the big three. After he returned home, Taylor immediately murdered his wife by ripping out her eyes and tongue and then tearing off most of the skin from her face, finally strangling their pet poodle. Police found Taylor standing in the street naked and covered in blood shouting, it is the blood of Satan. This is truly one of the most graphic crimes I've ever read about, honestly. Like to think that this happened in real life is extremely scary. Also, if he was possessed by some type of demon Demon. Like, what demon was this and how do we all avoid this? I feel like this is pretty pertinent information considering what Taylor ended up doing. Number five on this list is the stone pressing. Let's take a second and think of the worst ways to die. Just a little thought experiment. Drowning, that would suck for sure. Apparently that is one of the worst pains you'll ever feel. Being burned alive, that would be really freaking bad. Nothing seems to hurt more than a bad burn. I think, um, you know, getting eaten alive, like that just full on getting mauled by something, that would suck. You know, I can't imagine that would feel very good. But you know what you probably didn't think of there is getting squished. And to specifically qualify that, getting squished slowly. The reason that didn't come to mind is because no one really thinks about that as a way to go, but now that we are thinking about it, I think that ranks pretty high on my list of horrible ways to die. Getting squished slowly is exactly what happened to a poor man in the Salem witch trials. Ranker says 19 people were executed during the Salem witch trials in early 1691, most of whom were hanged. Giles Corey, however, received a different sentence. During his trial, his torturers tried to make him admit to practicing black magic and being devoted to the devil. They did this by piling rocks on his chest one by one while demanding he confess. All his neighbors watched as he was crushed in a pit, only willing to say, more weight, rather than confess to something that he had not done. These proved to be his final words before he was pressed to death and was buried in an unmarked grave. Imagine just walking out your door one day, minding your own business, then getting taken away by the authorities, accused of something that you probably have absolutely no knowledge of, and then found guilty of that said thing. Then as your punishment for that crime that you know, you didn't do. You get taken to the public square and all of your neighbors and friends come out to watch as you get rocks slowly piled onto your body, eventually resulting in all of your bones to break and your internal organs to burst. Yeah. This really sucked for my dude Giles. The Salem Witch Trials, in my opinion, are one of the most messed up times in history. Like that entire scenario is just one freaking mess, people losing their minds over something that they don't understand. And poor Giles got crushed for it, and now we can all remember on his tombstone. Number four on this list is specimens. Whenever I hear the word specimen, I get a pretty distinct image of science and laboratories, test subjects. I think of movie scenes where there are vials of weird substances and really smart people doing some really questionable forward thinking stuff. What I really don't want to be thinking about though is dead bodies. That's pretty much what we have here though. 
Creepy says, Ohio Asylum is known for its creepy and thrilling gravestones. However, two of those gravestones are amongst the most horrific ones. These tombstones read the word specimens only, with no other details like date or name. What freaks people out is the imagination of what the word specimens could possibly be referring to. What are these specimens of? Many theories have been made. Specimens of body parts of the deceased or bodies of on whom the untested medications were tested. We always knew that the old asylums were bad news, but this is taking it to another level. Like old asylums back in the day would run some very questionable experiments against people's wills and do things that they never should have done. This was also absolutely ridiculous because the whole point of these places should have been to help people who are dealing with mental issues. Even after all of this though, I never would have thought that it would have gotten to this. To be sent to this place, and then later, after having had multiple experiments done on you that your body probably didn't respond well to, to then be reduced to a small box buried outside that reads specimens on it. To not even have a name anymore, but just to be considered a failed science experiment. This is some super sick and twisted stuff right here, guys, and it's part of the reason why asylums were feared for so long. Number three on this list is the baby monster. This one is not only scary, but it's also really sad. If a gravestone has the word monster on it to describe what is underneath said gravestone, then one gets a pretty scary and creepy image. This is not the full truth though when it comes to what happened with this gravestone. Creepy says, this tombstone was inscribed in a time when the word monster was often used to describe a person with serious deformities in any form. Considering that, and also the short span of time for which the baby lived, it can be theorized that the baby was severely deformed and could not live for very long. The death of said individual is not certain and it's intriguing to know that no real name was given to this baby. When this child would have been buried, you have to imagine that it would have been in an era where whatever deformities it did have wouldn't have been understood. People may have suspected the devil or some demonic presence to have caused what happened here. The sad truth is that this was a kid just like anyone else who just kind of got a little bit unlucky at birth. Back in this day, that sort of unluckiness though wouldn't have been accepted or tolerated. So in this case, we're just left with a really creepy gravestone that should make us all very thankful that we were born in this era and not back then when this sort of stuff would happen. Number two on this list, the Unforgiving Society. This next one should make you very happy that you live in the time period that you do now, but also make you think a lot about some of the recent political shifts going on in the United States. Creepy says, this tombstone is of a girl who died a sad death. She passed away in very unfortunate circumstances. She was impregnated before marriage, after which she struggled to get an for her parents' honor. When making her tombstone, the creators could not help but feel guilt for her story. The words on the tombstone describe how unfair and unforgiving the cruel society had been to her. Now the tombstone actually reads, Kate McCormick, seduced and pregnant by her father's friend. Unwed, she died from a her only choice. Abandoned in life and death by family, with but a single rose from her mother. Buried only through the kindness of unknown benefactors. Died February 1875, age 21. Victim of an unforgiving society, have mercy on us. Now the first thing that I thought of when I read this was the laws that are being stripped right now in the United States. This is a very polarizing issue where strong opinions are had on all sides, but this tombstone, in my opinion, is a clear example of what can happen when that right is stripped away from women. Kate didn't deserve the fate that she got, and maybe the scariest part about all of this is that this storyline, the one that we saw right here, I mean, a similar one could still happen today. And finally, number one on this list is Mary C. Don Lenchi. Mary C. really wasn't too fond of the people who put her where she is now. In fact, she hated them so much that she put a curse on them, one that might still be running rampant throughout their bloodlines to this day. Her tombstone read, May eternal damnation be a upon those in wailing part who, without knowing me, have maliciously vilified me. May the curse of God be upon them and theirs. Now, the crazy part about all this though is that apparently her neighbors and the people that she's cursing
noticing they didn't do anything wrong to her. Creepy says, as shown by the words on the tombstone, Mary C. felt nothing but anger towards her neighbors. The delusions she had of her neighbors conspiring against her are depicted on this tombstone. She left all of her possessions to the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals after her death in 1985. The neighbors reported how the deceased used to constantly indulge in petty fights and negative behaviors. So apparently this curse was just her being super petty. Imagine you only have a few more words on planet Earth and instead of like telling your family you love them and stuff, you decide to curse your neighbors who literally did nothing wrong to you. This curse hasn't been super effective though, which is a good thing. Apparently some of the members of the cursed family have noticed something every now and again, but nothing too major that should make anybody freak out. Still though, really hoping that I don't become my neighbor's punching bag and get cursed from beyond the grave for literally nothing.